Hi, everybody. Welcome to Profiling Evil by Mike King and Chris McDonough. Chris, how you doing tonight? Mike, how are you, buddy? It's great to see you. <laughs> doing great. This is going to be a wild show tonight. I'm actually working off of my mobile phone tonight. Chris is a hotspot. The internet's gone out. I'm going to keep checking. Hopefully, I'll get full bandwidth. But gosh, it looks like it's uh, working pretty good. How's your day been? It's been fine. It's been great. You guys have had some uh, real interesting things happening up there. Last week, you had the the big weather, you know, event. How, what, how did that go? How'd that go? Oh, it was it was crazy. I mean, uh, they report that some winds were 110 miles per hour in the canyons. We live about, I don't know, a half a mile from a canyon, and uh, there were trees down everywhere. I mean, it looked like a war zone in some of the areas, and uh, the thing that just blew my mind is I have a metal basketball standard cemented in the ground uh -huh. and the wind actually snapped that metal pole and sent that thing like a javelin with a cell on it across the neighborhood. <laughs> but oh. thankfully it landed in the grass and didn't hurt anybody. But uh, yeah, it's been, been a pretty wild week. We've been with and without power for a week. I, we're grateful. We have some power uh, now. Uh, there are still some people seven days now they've been without power. Oh it's kind of like living in South Carolina, isn't it? I'll tell you what, you know, you get five days to leave, though, when those storms are coming. So, <laughs> you know, we're good. And thinking of that, we have to, you know, give a shout out to all of our friends in the Gulf Coast right now who may be in the line of uh, some pretty heavy duty storms coming. So you're going to be in our prayers, uh, definitely. And uh, Mike, I mean, we uh, can you believe how blessed we've been? It's just amazing. And, yes, and I look at the the names of people streaming in right now, and and I want to call out some of them in, a ju in just a minute. And, and again, folks, we just ask you to please hit that subscribe button and please uh, ring the bell so that you get notifications. Uh, Chris, I wanted to make mention uh, two, two police officers in California shot last night. I mean, what a what a horrible thing. And the, and the response of some of the public in trying to even add salt to that wound has been just really painful. Yeah. You know, I mean, Sheriff Villarreal, he went on uh, that live, uh, you know, press conference and um, you know, it, it's just horrific. I mean, you, I think everybody has seen the, the video of these, you know, two warriors, you know, standing alongside that pillar. And you see the one officer, she was shot through the face through the shoulder, through the arms, and she still put a tourniquet on her partner. Yeah, it just you tell me that's not heroic. Yeah, yeah unreal. And, unreal. And I don't know if you saw the notice from the president of the International Association of Chiefs of Police yeah. today, but that was really touching. And at the end, folks, if you get a chance, go to iacp.net and read the the president's statement. But at the end. He says, this is not how a civil society solves problems. Yeah. And uh, not, nothing good comes from something like this. It's just so heartbreaking. But anyway, Chris, let's yeah. uh, let's jump in. Why don't you tell uh, tell us who some of the people are that are here tonight? I'll tell you what, we've got a we've got an incredible show for everybody tonight because uh, we're you're gonna see some stuff that uh, nobody has ever seen. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tip my hat right now, but uh, we've got uh, Mark Johnson here. Uh, he's going to show us some stuff. We've got Andy is here. Uh, and then we've got another treat uh, towards the end. Uh, we'll kind of hold that uh, in our pocket. But, uh, you know, guys and gals, thank you so much for being in the, the, our, our team and our family. We're, we're just so grateful to you. And if you can, you know, we get this out of the way in the beginning. Just hit that subscribe button down in the bottom there. Press those, you know, turn them blue or whatever, the thumbs up. And uh, it just keeps us uh, giving you uh, hopefully the greater content uh, that uh, you, you're, you've you been asking for. So, Mike, I, I code 33, let's put our... Well, you know what? Let's welcome yeah. everyone to choir practice, but let's uh, call out yeah. a couple of people like Gardy Lou, uh, Lulu, uh, 45 One's mom, Ron's mom. Uh, Manuel is here, Mimi J2. I mean, it just, the, the house is filling up fast. And for our guests, I'm excited to say, I mean, we're already at 500 people that are, that are sitting in the boxes out here. Uh, folks, we appreciate everything you do to support us. We appreciate the memberships, the super chats, all of that just helps us to continue to push content out. And we're really thankful tonight for Tim, our associate producer, 
who's stepping in and running the things while uh, while Tyler's out goofing off. Uh, but let's let's bring in uh, Andy and and yeah, Chris, say it again. Code thirty three. Let's get going. Andy's here. Andy, you're uh, you're on mute, buddy. And because uh, um, show Andy, can you hear us? Okay. Okay, you're on mute. Let's uh, hit the unmute button. There you go. And can you hear us? We can see you moving, but you're you're still on mute. So be just a second. Yeah, let's let's. Uh, and go. while he's getting, oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> hey, Andy, how are you? That's okay. How are you doing? I'm doing okay, thank you. So we have uh, you have some good stuff uh, coming up here. And we just, you know, this is our weekly chat. What, uh, uh, where are you at so far? Maybe we can talk about some of the logistics or what, what do you want to talk about? Uh, well, um, the first research. thing I want to talk about is the fact that we are leaving on, on the 22nd, Alexandria, Indiana, and uh, we'll arrive in Colorado on the 23rd, which is one day early. And that's my Indiana group. We're going to meet at our local junior high in Alexandria, and uh, we'll caravan from there out that way. So how many people do you have coming from Indiana, Andy? I know you got a lot of people that are going to be doing support from there to help you out. Uh, but, but yeah, what do you got coming? I think there's around uh, th – We've got a, a really bad Wi-Fi connection. Andy, if maybe there's a better place in the house you can move to, um, that might be helpful. Yeah, and, and uh, while she's doing that, Sophie H., thank you. Elizabeth Townsend, thank you so much for that uh, contribution. And, uh, yeah, we we uh, all extend our thoughts and prayers to your mother who's got cancer. And uh, this this family, you're profiling evil families there, 66 uh 66 Lester, uh, thank you so much for the donation. Uh, you guys are just so amazing and so awesome. And frankly, that really helps us to continue to try to push out some good content. Karen Olson, thank you. Andy, I don't know if you can see that. Love and blessings to you and your family. And the the love has been pouring in on emails. Uh, it's just been gratifying to watch. But let's see now how your audio is. I should be better now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and thank you to her for that. I appreciate that. That warms my heart every time. Yeah, thank you, folks. So you were saying you're going to meet at the Alexander Junior High Correct. and in a carpool. So go over that again because you kind of broke up, bud. Okay. Um, so on the 22nd, we're going to meet at the Alexandria Junior High in the parking lot. It's a large parking lot, and we're going to leave from there for Colorado. And we're going to drive straight through and arrive on the 23rd. Okay, perfect. And I know some of the logistics here, you're working on points of contact. And by the way, folks, so everybody knows Andy and I are in and Mike, we're in sync on a daily basis. Uh, you know, we, we, we've been waiting for, you know, a, a total count. And I think right now we're up to about 382 that came through the website and how many do you have on your side, Andy? Um, I've got about 35. And then of course, I don't think we're counting on the volunteers from out there entirely with the right. uh, police and sheriff and, and CBI. Right. So you're going to be well over 500 plus in the, this. Is I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. This is fantastic. Well, yeah. one of those, one of those challenges that we all want to make sure, you know, or gets resolved is some of the logistics. So Andy's working on, identifying, you know, skill sets. And then what, what was your plan, Andy? Kind of go over what you've been talking about, what we've been kind of discussing here in terms of, you know, the team sizes and that kind of stuff. Yeah, what I'd hope to do is when we get out there, we're going to identify, or actually before that, we'll identify the people that are familiar with the area and that are involved with search and rescue. And we'll appoint some of them team leaders and then what we'll do is we'll grade everybody on ability and apply you to the areas that you can best be used. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, uh, as Mike had mentioned, you know, on our last last Monday, we just want to make sure that, you know, folks are, you know, if you want to help, 
but you can only pass out water. That's okay. That's, that's a good thing. If you can't be there, but you want to help, that's okay too. Your prayers are, are more than enough. Uh, and I know, you know, Andy and I have talked about this with Michael as, as well at length, but we also don't want anybody hurt, right? Andy, you don't want anybody, you know, cause this is rough terrain potentially. So uh, with the sheriff's department being on board now, which was a huge home run, uh, CBI is going to have assets there. Uh, they'll probably, you know, utilize a command center of some sort, you hope, right? Yes. Has Colorado Search and Rescue reached out to you yet? But I know they're going to be there based on the sheriff's statement. Yeah, um, just a few of them that have signed up. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, those are your, those are your team leaders because those guys and gals, those are the folks that know what time it is out there and they, yeah. and they can understand. And so... And then, Michael, uh, we're working on a couple of things. I don't know when you want to you know, talk about that on the other side of it uh, in terms of, um, you know, some of the stuff that's coming. But I'll, I'll leave that. I can you know, I don't want to get ahead of it. Uh, what are your thoughts, Mike? Yeah, well, um, first, I got to I got to just tell you, Andy, I mean, things are rolling in here. People are, are sending notes. Cook Goose, thank you so much for your donation. Andy Crayons, thank you. Uh, you. You have helped us so much, especially on, and I keep forgetting the name of the after meeting, Discord, Discord. Thank you so much for all you've been doing on Discord, Andy. And uh, Miss Sophia, thank you. I mean, she, Andy, she, she sends $70 saying, thank you for all the hard work you're doing for us, the families and the victims. I mean, um, and, and and maybe this is a perfect opportunity to just mention, folks, we have been able to get a, a major mapping company to donate some software to Andy's effort. Uh, there'll be 500 licenses of uh, software to, to help in the tracking and, and so that Andy has a clear picture each day of where people have been. We don't know how all that will work and how it'll come together because this is going to be done on a volunteer basis instead of really supported by this company, but uh, people are stepping up to help you, Andy, like crazy. And and I just can't imagine what this must feel like for you after so many months of silence. Well, it feels great to finally be able to do something for crying out loud. Um, you know, Mike and Chris, the, the awful fact of the matter is probably nothing great that's going to come out of this. But I'm sure that I'll meet some interesting and nice people, and I'll take solace in that for now. Um, you know, I so appreciate all the help. It's just heartwarming. And like I said, I hope I can pay this forward at some time. You already, you already are. I think everybody that's hearing your voice even tonight can see it in your countenance, Andy. I can see it in your countenance, friend. Yeah. You know, this is what you have done in the last three weeks. Uh, you know, I, Mike and I were talking about this the other night. And we said to ourselves, you know, had Andy not come forward, you know, three, four weeks ago, shoot, who's talking about Suzanne? No one. No one. No one. Exactly. And when you approached us and said, look, I need help finding my sister. I mean, the least we could have done was, you know, this, this, you know, what you're doing here tonight. I mean, we're not doing anything. This is just the platform that you have, you know, you're – you're putting your message out there and we're just grateful that, that this platform exists to, to, to let that happen. And well, to um, be honest with you guys, it was an impossible task for me by myself. So you got to give yourself a little bit of credit too. Um, the, the advice and the help you've given me is just unbelievable to me. Well, we, we appreciate your kindness in there, Mike. I mean, what do you, uh, uh, well, you know, he, he, here's the, here's the answer. P prayers for you, Andy. This is from Four Sons' mom, yeah, uh, and all the rest of those able to help with the search. We all wish we had brothers like you, yeah. and uh, I just gotta utter amen. Um, you you have people who are just so grateful for the example you're given. True Crime Junkie sent uh, twenty bucks in, saying, "Praying faithfully for your family and the girls." Suzanne's story stole my heart from day one. Lots of love from Lake Charles, Louisiana. Um, on, the, on the screen, um, Mary Dethy Del Z, 
Andy has the star of Bethlehem shining over her shoulder on screen. I'm, uh, Elizabeth Townsend, uh, Andy, thank God for Big Brothers and a donation. I mean, if that doesn't tell you you're hitting the right mark, and I know there have been some critics of the fact that you had to step up, but you did have to step up, and God bless you. Yeah, I mean, nobody else was doing anything. That's pretty obvious. I mean, I know that the FBI and CBI and the Sheriff's Department are working on it as best they could, but they're over budgeted and out of money, and they don't have any answers. So I hope that we can go out there and turn something up. Well, well, let me pop one uh, one other one up because I know you've had a, a few psychic mediums that you've talked to, but here's a stay-at-home mom detective, $100. Uh, please check out her blind spot on YouTube. Um, I know that you've talked to a few, and I know that um, you're continuing to consider that and think about it in the whole process of everything you're doing. But uh, this this uh, is, is all um, – it, it's going to give you at least – peace of mind. And I've had a couple people, I don't know, Andy, what do you say to those that say, well, maybe you aren't going to find anything? Well, you know, first off, I'm going to keep an upbeat attitude and think that I will. And secondly, there's always that possibility. And that's what I said. Nothing good's going to come out of this. If I find something, it's not good. And if I don't find something, that's not good either. But at least as a brother, I can know that I tried my best. So how are you hanging? How, how are you holding in, Andy, as a friend? I mean, you know, you've got we've got almost a thousand people watching right now that absolutely love you. And this is just, you know, for what you're doing. I mean, you know, how are you holding up, though? I mean, let's. Well, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, Mike. I'm exhausted, but I'm going to spend four days with my dad in Michigan and uh, take him to a couple doctor's appointments. And uh, I'm going to rest. And I'm going to gather for you. Okay. I'm going to gather steam. Then I'm going to drive back to Indiana and pack my bags and head straight west. Okay. So, okay. you know, um, physically, I'm a little wore out, but part of that's due to work. And uh, I got a little bit of that behind me now. So, uh, a little rest, RR coming up, quality time with dad, and I'm ready. Awesome. Well, you know, you got the best jeans root beer, too. Yeah. I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I cannot, you know, uh, I, I love your dad and, and just your family. I mean, just, we, we've come to know you guys and, um, you're just such good people and, and it's going to be, you know, either way, um, you know, either way it will be a positive outcome. One day you will look back, uh, whether it's plus or minus brother, right? One day though, you will look back. And you will know that you did everything in your power. Everything. That's, that's what and, I'm trying to accomplish. Yep. yep. So, you know, keep going. We're here with you. Everybody's here with you. Uh, and if you need anything, you know, uh, just reach out, let us know. I mean, I know we talk on a daily basis, but at the same time, um, some of the logistics folks, you know, just, you know, just be patient with us right now, with Andy right now, because he's got a lot on his plate trying to, you know, keep, keep some things together, but you have the list of all the people. Yes. Uh, you need to identify a couple of key players in, in Colorado, I think is what you were saying. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I want, so, to, I want to find people that are professionals and are familiar with that area. Once okay. that's established, then I can start setting these teams up and we'll make it happen on the 24th. Okay, perfect. I actually have to get out there to get this done, you know. So yeah. I'm going out a day early to prepare. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know how to organize them. stuff. I know you do. You've, yeah. you've <laughs> your family's run a successful business for a very long time, and and you're on a mission. I told somebody recently. They asked me. I said, "This guy's on a mission." Yeah, there's no way. I am, <laughs> and I'm good. I want to get with the sheriff and CBI out there as well. I mean, you have to realize they hold some important information. And yeah. they also know how to organize a search. So if I get ahead of myself too far, they may have a whole different set of ideas. I really don't want to change the midstream. So I'm yeah. going out and that's the first thing I'm doing is meeting with them. Awesome. Yep, yeah. yeah, definitely. Well, Chris, so, I, I want to just shout out a couple of people um, because I don't want them lost off of the, off of the board here. Retired Sergeant Melinda Leffler. Uh, I mean, Andy, we've got, 
actually a growing number of cops on this channel that are retired now, and we're just thrilled to have them here. And thank you for that uh, wonderful donation, Melinda. That is so awesome. Cheryl Parks, thank you so very much for helping out, and we wish you could be there too. Frankly, Chris and I wish we were going to be there, but we're going to we're going to be running the nighttime command post, right, Bear? Um, uh, Andy, we're going to be That's getting right. a nightly update. Karen Olson, thank you. Um, we have passed on all of the information that you shared as well. And uh, Chris, I don't know if you got anything else, but we wanted to introduce Andy to somebody too tonight. Yeah, no, let's get on it. Let's uh, let's move. Yeah, um, let's, let's let's bring in Mark Johnson. Mark is uh, he's the CEO and president of a company called Visual Law, Andy. Um, Mark and his company are working on some of the biggest criminal cases around the world. And, uh, and uh, we're going to have him just kind of explain a little bit about what his company does. And while it's all now hindsight, uh, maybe some of the, this is giving us an opportunity to help law enforcement today that's in the saddle handling the next missing person understand some of the technology that's available uh, that, that people in law enforcement can take advantage of. So, Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really an honor. And I'm just delighted to meet Andy and help however we can. Thank you, Mark. Oh, thanks, Mark. Why don't, you, why don't you tell everybody what Visual Law does? And, uh, and let's just talk because we're going to kind of segue, Andy, and we're going to talk a little bit about Suzanne's case because uh, Mark actually spent some time this week looking over some of the terrain where this happened. And uh, this is going to be very specific to you and your family's issue. But then we're going to kind of move and start talking a little bit about the day bills as well as we, we continue. Mark, go ahead. Don't, don't go yeah. anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, uh, you know, just was pleased that you brought this to my attention and we could discuss it a little bit. So I didn't have a lot of time today, Andy, but, but we will. Uh, our company specializes in forensic documentation as well as forensic visualization, kind of a big word, but basically it means showing accurately uh, a crime scene or a disaster scene, and we use a lot of digital tools to do that. We also interface with um, a number of law enforcement groups and particularly with search and rescue, which is kind of relevant here. In the case of, a, of an incident where somebody goes missing, and obviously everybody knows it's critical at the early stage, but uh, it's really important, if possible, to try to get out uh, today with drone technology because it allows you to get high resolution imagery and also we fly uh, thermal based sensors that can uh, detect activity not just uh, heat per se but in terms of disturbances uh, ground clandestine graves things that uh, would not be apparent uh, through visual sight uh, directly there's also uh, some new software that's been developed and we've been working with the uh, uh, the major manufacturer who's producing it that's helping uh, coordinate searches much about what uh, Mike was talking about in terms of, and you were talking, uh, Andy, about how you need to coordinate on the ground because an area that's searched, that gets searched twice, is uh, that much real estate that uh, is wasted in terms of time and resources. And so uh, a lot of times a drone command center will be allowed to coordinate, identify, mark, and then highlight areas of uh, deserving other interest. In this instance, you know, had we been called and if we were assisting early on, uh, it's really important to try to uh, get out to the scene, but also, and something that may be helpful, this is a very remote area, uh, we have access to uh, a number of image libraries, both uh, aerial satellite based and terrestrial uh, photogrammetric imaging. It's possible to go into the historical record. And in this case, I understand it's Mother's Day. Um, and so it's it's very recent. So there is constantly overflights that are being done. And to the extent that we may be lucky if this area was uh, cataloged and flown, for photogrammetric purposes, there may be some information that would be useful. At a very minimum, I'm, I'm going to be pulling some of the aerials and I'll be making them available to you that they may be uh, something that's useful to plan and coordinate your search. I know Mike uh, shared with me some uh, extraordinary 
uh, GIS work he did that uh, identified potential areas. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that's kind of what we do. And we'll get into it more later in the show and some of the specifics. But in your particular case, it's all based upon uh, eyes on the ground and eyes above the ground. And to the extent that uh, uh, even if not this time, maybe upcoming uh, some drone uh, uh, work may be able to reveal some areas or at least get you to be able to see where you couldn't efficiently get to. And the main thing is to get real estate covered, particularly if you uh, don't know exactly what you're looking for or where you're looking for it. Well, can I ask you a question, Mark? Oh, absolutely, Andy. Um, this kind of sounds like what I've seen on TV is LIDAR. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, that does. It's uh, And it's 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 different. Uh, there's a couple things that are going on there. Uh, the, the first problem is that today, LIDAR, that's basically a laser-based scanning that allows you to uh, – it's, it's heavily used in uh, – identifying geological formations and terrain. It's, uh, the, the United States Geological Survey right now has most of the United States mapped with LIDAR so that uh, it has, uh, there are data sets available. We work with them all the time and then we use our own LIDAR instrumentation on the ground. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem, and we do fly LIDAR with drones, uh, but right now the payload weight makes it inefficient and the big problem is that most of what you're looking for in a situation like this is visual based and the LIDAR is pinging back individual laser points and it's not going to give you anything close to the resolution that a high resolution uh, camera or a thermal camera would. However, it's useful for mapping the terrain and recognizing the terrain. And if you get into some very, very specific areas, if you had a canyon, for instance, that is uh, of importance, you can actually use terrestrial LIDAR or aerial-based LIDAR to uh, to map and determine that. But for your purposes right now, from a, a, the case as I understand it, and I'm a newcomer obviously to the case, but to find Suzanne is going to be heavily based upon visual cues, maybe to some extent, um, it, probably it, historical record that shows disturbance of uh, ground, activity, human activity, uh, spoilage. There are all sorts of cues that search and rescue and forensic specialists will, will look at. And, you know, for instance, in the Daybell case that we'll be talking about, uh, we did find a satellite image that actually shows evidence of the disturbed earth. Had we known at the time, if anybody had said, Hey, why don't we take a look at Chad Daybell's property could have had a drone up there and could have gotten great information. The problem is knowing where to look. And until they got uh, the phone records, they had no clue. There is nobody to my knowledge was even thinking that there would be a possibility. And in your case, it's the same thing. So you're getting all these great tips, people, uh, you know, and if, if I'm, if I'm in your shoes, I'll take any information I get, um, and, and any, any lead, um, and then I would rely upon the professionals to call that down to be information that can be used to search uh, appropriately. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I think LIDAR has very little application in this particular instance, but I do think visual-based sensors or infrared sensors very well could. And, and you know, you and I can talk even offline. Uh, you know, my heart goes out to you and uh, to the extent that I can be a resource, you know, count on me. Okay. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Absolutely. I was just trying to compare it to something that I did understand. So that's why yeah. it's in LIDAR. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's a, it, it's a big word now because everybody is uh, LIDAR based. Uh, as a matter of fact, most of the self-driving cars are now LIDAR based. And so you've got the spinning laser beam and multiple sensors on the, uh, you know, everybody from Uber to Apple to uh, Google are now driving cars based on being able to laser image objects. But the, the point is they're just basically registering geometry. In your instance, you're looking for more subtle cues and more high resolution cues, you know, to know that there's an object 10 feet ahead of your car is great for driving to avoid it. But to actually know what that object is, you have to rely on high resolution sensors. And so, but anyway, I hope that wasn't too, dense for uh, your audience and didn't put people to sleep but boy to the extent that we can help uh, andy we will sure <laughs> offer our help i appreciate that well you should start on uh, probably friday night and work your way in 
I, I, I absolutely. And uh, I, I've started looking now where the historical record is. And, you know, it, it gets to be a, a bit of a, a crapshoot as to whether an overflight of the, of the right sensor and if there was no cloud cover, all of these things have to align. But the good news is that there are hundreds of eyeballs in space registering, you know, everything from the CIA to, uh, uh, you know, the commercial companies, but to the extent that we could plug into a database that may have had an overflight of a high enough resolution or county, uh, governmental and, uh, private surveying companies will often have done data runs that can be accessed. And there are now a number of companies that are collecting that to try to make that available. And, uh, information is valuable. So, you know, that's working in your favor. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to get something before I go out. That's for sure. Well, absolutely. It's uh, what is this Monday? Yeah. All right. Well, let me see what we can do. Um, <laughs> y- you know, and uh, I love Mark. He's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, I love you guys. I felt like uh, I, I feel almost uh, embarrassed to be so f- shallow on this subject because I hadn't uh, been aware of the case. But I will certainly get up to speed. Thank you. Well, uh, Andy, I mean, I, ho- I hope this is helpful. And if nothing more, you're going to get the most up-to-date view of things as you try to start planning things out. And uh, we'll, we'll make sure that, that you and Mark are connected so you can talk offline and, and really dig into what you want to share. Cause I know there are some things, you know, personally that we haven't really let out and you, you may want to get some imagery for those areas and other things. Certainly. Thank you. Good deal. Well, Chris, what do you think? Uh, Mike, I mean, Omar Mark was just hanging out in the Midwest. He's off in California, but he's on COVID alert. So, you know, and uh, what Mark, I mean, Mark, thank you. I mean, just mm-hmm. you, you're going to, you're going to find that um, this is just a marvelous family. And, and, you know, this, this gal has been gone, for, you know, we're into four months now and she's just vanished. Yeah. And, and it's clear from what I've learned just today that this, the circumstances um, are sinister on so many levels and there needs to be a number of doors pried open uh, metaphorically to find, uh, to find out what happened here. And uh, you're, I, I just can't, can't even tell you how much I am emotionally invested in what you're doing. And, this is this is what I call the hive mind, the internet, and uh, you know it can absolutely be horrendous, but it can also be good. And in this instance, I think you've got a lot of people who not only wish you well, but they want to do well for you. And uh, count me among that number. So the more people that we can get, you know, you got to keep this in the in the public eye. This story has to be told, and uh, don't ever apologize for grabbing cameras camera time that you can get under any circumstances because it just takes the one tip to open up, uh, you know, the evidence to the, to the solution. So I really, really, I think this is absolutely fantastic. I hope you've got people that are doing press releases and, you know, this is, uh, this is a story that's competing with so much news right now, but it's one that absolutely grabs by the throat. And anybody with a heart can recognize it. And and I just, uh, you know, it's hard for me not to break down tears now myself just uh, thinking about it. So, you know, let's not get angry. Let's get uh, let's get busy. That's exactly right. Yeah. Good job. Yep. Well, you know, Mark, thank you. And uh, Andy, by the way, you know, the, the, he's the this is the real deal. Yeah. You know, the, these guys that are coming to the table here, these are top of the top of the cream. I mean, they are the best in the industry. And uh, I know Mark's pretty humble there, but uh, he's going to break down the Daybell case here uh, in a couple of minutes. And, um, you know, that's who everybody went to. Uh, And so you're going to get the same guy uh, looking for, you know, helping you, you know, as you two, you know, correlate together and and discuss some things with Suzanne. So, uh, you know, Mike, again, he pulled another rabbit out of his hat. Uh, I know, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's just great to keep seeing 
such great people coming to the table for you and your family. Oh, you, you can see the heart that Mark has. Andy, yes, definitely. Uh, uh, let's put that question from Sonny back up. Um, Sonny Aaron, and you may not be able to answer this, but she, she donated $20 and said, Hey, have you uh, said anything about Barry's phone pings or, or uh, if he's made uh, sure the girls were away? Uh, sorry, just want this case solved for my heart hurts so badly with such sadness. I mean, isn't this beautiful? But yeah, I mean, what what can you share with these folks that wouldn't be uh, in, inappropriate at this time? Well, I do know they have collected the EVI information, which is electronic vehicle information. The cell phone part has been kept really private by the investigators. And there must be a reason behind that. I'm not going to question it. They just they've kept that to themselves. Now, when I get out there, what I pray for is they give me suspect areas to search. And um, as far as his cell phone goes, I have no knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. Well, um, let, let me just tell you, uh, 1,300 people on right now, uh, th there are lots of people hearing. And, and maybe you could just share with Mark uh, quickly the change that's happened in the last four or five weeks since you finally decided it's time to step up because he asked about is it get, are you getting the publicity and the press releases and other things uh yeah i mean tremendous amount and uh lauren Scharf from fox 21 did some really interesting interviews that i would beg you to watch um if you think some things were sinister before when you watch those you're really going to think that uh i know i do and um here again, you know, my, my sole mission is to find my sister. I'm not a judge, not a jury, and I'm not the police. They can deal with the rest. Um, I just, I need to find Suzanne. And I know if I turn up that bit of evidence, it will help them tremendously. So that's my goal. That's my only goal. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's thank Andy. And Andy, we're going to park you if you want to just sit in the back room and watch, or if you've got other things to do, we may bring you back in if you, or you know how to come back in. I think you just yell at Tim and tell him you got to get back in. We're going we're gonna to talk to Mark a little bit, kind of switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, the Daybell case. And again, with uh, almost 1,400 people, just wish you Godspeed as you organize this hunt and uh and put together everything we know you have some really big interviews coming up this week and we wish you the very best that's going to get you some real big uh national attention so yeah. mark you are uh incredible brother thank you for being here oh, yeah, this is awesome i am humbled by you guys it's uh what you've done and and what you've put together here it's just uh a joy to be able to to come on and uh rub shoulders with you well, Chris, uh, Mark is no slacker, as you can tell. He is a, a lawyer by trade. Uh, got, I think, a little bit um, tired of sitting at a desk or something because he founded this company. He's worked with the biggest names in the business as far as uh, as uh, organizations and companies. And, uh, and Mark, why don't you maybe just share a little bit more about what that life journey has been to build this and then Share what you do today on a case like the Vallo case. Well, sure. We, uh, uh, I'm a no spring chicken. <laughs> I've been doing this for 30 years, but before uh, this incarnation, I was a, a trial lawyer for 14 years. And so that helps in this. Uh, our clients typically are uh, attorneys or law firms or prosecutor offices. And, and ultimately, the work we do is... Uh, involved with trial and uh although uh, so you so the admissibility of what we do is critical there are a lot of companies that are phenomenally talented but if they don't understand the legal basis of uh, admitting evidence of what's required and particularly the tax that you're going to have to defend if you are you know going to get in this business because everything done in law is adversarial there is a uh, a counterpart to it to anyone and anything. And if you have uh, a prosecutor, you have a defense attorney. And if you have, uh, uh, you know, a, a major disaster, uh, such as the conception uh, diving uh, case that we're working on, there's lots of attorneys and lots of well-funded uh, defense corporations who are opposing the attempts by the family to seek compensation. And so 
we're used to it and my background helps in that regard. But what we really are focused on is technology and telling a story because today the, uh, the case, whether it's uh, the Daybell case or, you know, going way back in time, I did work on the Menendez brothers murder case briefly for a period of time. Uh, if a case goes to trial, there's 12 good citizens who are watching listening and eventually deciding what affects the fate uh, of the individual case, but also the rights of all of us uh, in this country. You know, and I'm a great proponent and believer in the American jury system. It's not perfect. In fact, there's a lot of imperfections, but I do firmly believe it's the best uh, that the world has come up with so far. So we try to tell a story with uh, our clients. Uh, we've worked actually both sides, uh, of every case. Uh, and uh, some of my favorite people in the world are criminal defense lawyers, as well as prosecutors. There are some people in both of those camps that are camps that are not my favorite people in the world, and some of whom I've uh, got a lot of bones to pick with, but that's the nature of, uh, of the system we have. So talking about the Daybell case, uh, we, we do we do cases like this uh, constantly because if you take the Daybell case, it's a high profile case. People all over the world are interested in this crime. And we still don't even know what all the crimes are going to be uh, after everything falls out because there's pretty, pretty good bet that you're going to see uh, murder conspiracy or uh, very likely uh, some type of uh, homicide uh, charges beyond what they're charged with now. So you're here first, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, the, the case itself though, is, um, is one that involves, uh, a great deal of complexity. And right now we know a big part of the crime scene, which took place on this property, uh, getting back to what Andy, uh, you know, is confronting. It really is a it's a great example to look at why you have to keep your 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 ears open, your eyes open, and you have to be able to think outside of the box. Because going back, uh, you know, a year ago, <clears throat> you have uh, two kids missing, and finally, when uh, law enforcement gets involved uh, and the FBI gets involved, they put out a great uh, uh, plea for information from the public, and they publish a photo from. Uh, Yellowstone, where the two children with their uncle are there. We've since worked on that photo, look, identified exactly where it was taken, and it was taken, turns out, by Lori. And uh, that photo seemed to be critical. And so everybody was thinking, are there bodies in Yellowstone? Where are the kids? You know, And if you would have talked to anybody, myself included, about all of the possibilities of where these children uh, could be, I, I wouldn't have come up with Rexbury, Idaho in the backyard of Chad Daybill. But not only would he know now, in hindsight, that that's where they were, we know that there's a lot of indication that could have uh, revealed that had people been uh, uh, thinking in that direction because satellite imagery has shown disturbed dirt by the fire pit, which actually we now know is where uh, Tylee's remains were found in the pet cemetery. Uh, there's quite a bit of, uh, circumstantial information when you look at the reports, uh, from, uh, Mr. Daybell and the, the, the supposed sighting of a raccoon on the property even earlier than all of this occurred. Um, and when you look at what led to this being, becoming a fact, it was heavily based on the phone records of, uh, of the, uh, now deceased brother of Lori Vallo, Alex, uh, whose uh, phone revealed that he was at the property in the middle of the night, or excuse me, I'm sorry, in the, in the morning after uh, getting up in the middle of night and coming to Lori's apartment. And you can kind of put the pieces together. As soon as you have that information, it becomes obvious. It's like, oh my gosh, let's get a search warrant. Let's get out there. Well, law enforcement had a search warrant and they uh, searched the house and around the house, but they had no indication and no reason to suspect um, that there may be uh, clandestine graves in the backyard. So in this particular instance, um, 
I got interested in the case because obviously it's what we do, but also I saw a report on KSL television out of Salt Lake City where they had done the homework and the legwork to find a satellite image that uh, revealed it was taken just a few hours after uh, Alex was on the property. And I just sent him a note and said, you know, good job. This is fantastic. You know, there may be other imagery and we'd be happy to try to help. So, and, hey, Rufus, yes. okay. did I just hear you say you had a satellite image a few hours after he was on the property? Actually, yes. And it's uh, uh, the image was found um, by a marvelous reporter at KSL television. And I found out later, uh, I've now come to really respect his work, but he, uh, 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 Dave Colley is his name, and he he's actually the uh, producer and headed up the Cold podcast with the Susan Powell case. It's okay. one of the best true crime podcasts that's been produced, and I and I believe there's even going to be an update on that coming soon. So those of you who are following this, when you look at what happened with uh, with the Powell case and uh, the fact that. Her, her, you know, she's still missing. You can see how these, these, you have a lot of deja vu with what we're dealing with here uh, with Suzanne, and uh, and you need to start thinking about well, let's take advantage of what we have now, which is we, you know, we still are relatively fresh. Uh, getting out there now, turning over rocks, uh, and and effectively. In inspecting the premises and looking is the best way to get things rolling. And uh, so, yes, in this particular instance, uh, in, in all of my credit goes to uh, KSL news team and, and Mr. Cauley, who found the satellite image that was taken just hours after wow. the, uh, uh, after Alex was on the property. And in fact, you can go to their, uh, uh, you can go to their uh, website and you can you can find that image. It's not the best image in the world. There's a little bit of cloud cover, but absolutely 100% turns out that the darkened pixels are exactly where the pet cemetery was and where Tylee's uh, remains were found. So I communicated with them and we were talking about the case and I expressed my interest in what we do and uh, they... Uh, and they said, well, you know, if you were working on this case, what would you do? And I said, well, we'd do a visualization and I'd have somebody out there with a drone uh, and we'd start mapping and creating a three dimensional version of the crime scene. And he said, well, we've got drone pilots and they have a, a wonderful young woman who's a pilot who's never done this kind of work. But uh, she's a skilled pilot. And I said, I'll tell you what to fly and we'll do the processing. As a matter of fact, can I pull that up and we can talk about that now? Is that would that be appropriate? Please, yeah. All right, I'm going to go case, folks. I'm going to click share the screen and yeah. Well, uh, Mark's pulling this up. This is uh, Mark Johnson. He's the president and CEO of Visual Law, a company that takes lidar imagery or point data imagery from an environment, meshes it with aerial imagery, and brings together really rich content. In addition flies with drones over an area and he's going to walk us through what he's done on the Daybell property. You know, I just pulled up here. Uh, this happens to be part of a video memo that I actually sent to the KSL news team to explain what we're doing. And, and what you see here is the, the grid, I call this a lawnmower grid. Uh, and it's very simple. You fly it at one altitude and you shoot the camera directly down. And the key to this process is that you have to have at least 70%. And in my uh, request, uh, I wanted 90% uh, overlap between each images. So I gave instructions to the pilot. And then let me move this window out of the way. This happens to be all of those little uh, points up there. Those are the positions of the photographs that the drone took. So this is the, uh, this is the, path that Aubrey flew, and I can actually show you how uh, if we, I can show how each image, I take it down to the ground. You can see how these images all overlap, and the computer processes it, and then it creates, 
I will show you just a second here. Isn't this great, Chris? This is, uh, this is fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah, stuff. I think, think about even a case like uh, Matthew Checky. And if you'd have had this 3D dimension of the beach in, in uh, Oceanside for that little Tyke's murder. Look at this. I mean, we've got 1,360 folks here. Tell your friends, guys and gals, uh, this is fascinating stuff. So each of the little green balls is a, is a drone position. <coughs> and we flew this mission and, and we processed it to get the three-dimensional uh, uh, rough model that you see here. I then had uh, Aubrey go out and fly a series of oblique missions that filled in the vertical uh, uh, information that's missing. Uh, and so what you're really looking at here, these are all points, millions of them, that the computer has triangulated. Uh, and, and it goes back to a mathematical theory that is that if you have one object seen in at least three different photographs, in theory, you can determine where that object is in space. Because if a camera is moved, or if you have three overlapping images from a camera, there's only one place in the universe that an object can be in all three photos relative to the other objects in the photo. And so the computer just does a magnificent job of taking all of these overlapping uh, images and it registers every object that it recognizes, every pixel that has a particular brightness, a particular contrast, and that matches the surrounding pixels so that the computer can say, ah, that's the corner of a roof, or, oh, that's a leaf. Uh, and the amount of data, uh, you know, and we have to basically let this process overnight to be able to achieve these results. But when you're done, you get a, uh, a magnificent full point cloud that's accurate in terms of the objects. And so what we then have to do, given what our purpose is, we want to produce a model that is much more detailed and much more cinematic because in the end we're telling a story and we're wanting the jury to understand. So we created a model, which I'll now show you the, uh, so this is, uh, this is the, the final model. And for purposes of, uh, of KSL, we added uh, some forensic investigators. Um, now the way I've got this set, I've actually got individual blades of grass and you won't see them until I get close enough, which now you can just see the grass. And that's because of that's for processing load because uh, wow. we, we don't want um, we don't want to overlay when we're just when we're doing uh, visualization here and just, you know, like a video game. Uh, I want to lower the load on the processor. And so there's a lot of detail that when I finally click the button to produce the final result, uh, that detail will come in. But basically, um, what we've got here is the, the pond. And I'm going to zoom in. Let me pull this up here. So you've got the Daybell property down to the blades of grass. Yes. And uh, what you're going to see here. Unbelievable. So this is, uh, this is the... Uh, and then I've removed the surfaces, but this was where uh, JJ's poor JJ was found, and he was uh, in garbage bags, duct taped, and uh, the uh, the model actually allows us to go through the process. He was uh, covered with rocks, and then he had a uh, uh, a piece of uh, cheap uh, plywood or. Uh, uh, over a sheet of, uh, of, of wood plywood over him. And then, uh, and at the bottom of the, uh, of the grave was, was JJ. Now we had to build this based on the information we had from the testimony of the, uh, officers at the preliminary hearing. Uh, and they did introduce photographs, which we weren't allowed to see. And quite appropriately, the judge held those sealed. So we could only build this based upon the descriptions, but, um, it's the best we can do, and the purpose of this is to show the audience of the uh, KSL television what's possible, because in a perfect world, the prosecutor would call us up at some day and say, hey, we've got all the data, because they did have 
uh, uh, at least one ferro lidar scanner that captured all of this uh, in great detail. And they also took multiple photographs. So we could build a very, very precise version of this. And I'd love to do that. Uh, you know, and if, if uh, the time comes that somebody in the prosecution's office wants to uh, approach us, uh, we would love to work on this case. So uh, the, you can see already the advantage of this approach is because I can now show you how close this is to the uh, to the pet cemetery, right over here, and uh, there's actually a little statue of a dog on the uh, on a cinder block there that marks the pet cemetery. You can kind of see him down there underneath the uh, the pop up tent there. But uh, the uh, and I've actually turned off part of the ground here, so it looks weird. So I'm going to turn that back on here. There we go. Now, Mark, while you're while you're doing that, just out of curiosity, how explain for our audience how you would find like anomalies in the dirt uh, as a whole? Well, you know, and it's uh, it's not rocket science uh, in terms of mm -hmm. the typical uh, what what turns out that uh, in almost all instances, overgrowth, foliage, weeds have a distinct uh, growing pattern so that if you disturb the foliage, you're going to see that uh, very markedly. Or if you're dealing with bare ground, such as in this instance, you'll see uh, that the, the topsoil that's been disturbed is going to be of a darker hue. So visually, you'll see uh, differences in contrast and color value that will suggest, or you'll see in this particular instance, one of the testimony uh, testifying detectives said, they saw that the the uh, the weeds or the grass were much higher around a shorter grass where uh, JJ's body was. So anything that shows a difference in a growing pattern can be extremely uh, helpful and point that out. And of course, if you have anything fresh in terms of uh, a matter of days, you can find differences in temperature because exposing uh, the undersoil to the uh, sun uh, will produce a much different heat signature. And so that's why a lot of times we'll get a, uh, uh, an infrared camera that's uh, capable of measuring uh, heat in, uh, in sub-degree sub, uh, sub level of, of measurement. And you can sometimes get signatures that will suggest that. You can get all the way into esoteric, you know, ground uh, uh, ground penetrating lidar, which is you when know, we're talking about lidar. That's another type right. of of laser metrology, which is particularly uh, tuned to detect densities underneath the surface. And you know, it's you can't do that on a widespread area like a lidar flown with a plane. But if you know an area like this, you can get ground ground penetrating radar and work a work an area like this field and certainly efficiently determine uh, whether there's any hits that would make it uh, uh, a useful a useful place to to dig or to look uh, look further. Mike, so well, I mean, Mark, we, we got to have you back. I mean, there's a, you know, there's another huge case that I don't think I can talk about that uh, will uh, that has haunted this country for many years. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, actually, that's a good one, and I would love to come back and talk about that. So We've got we'll, some, some, we'll we will people with that. But what I wanted to do is give maybe uh, five minutes. Would you take a few questions, Mark? Oh, absolutely, happily, happily. I mean, one one right off the bat was this one right here from Halfway Blonde. Uh, do you need a search warrant to use drones over private property? You know, that's a good question. So here's the deal on drones. Um, the uh, uh, Drones are regulated by the Federal Aviation Administration. So the FAA considers a drone to be an aircraft. And so uh, if it is uh, an unmanned aircraft being operated uh, by remote control, if you're doing it commercially, you have to have a license. And they offer a certification. Of course, it's called the 107 certificate. and uh, you have to have a license in order to fly. And even with the license, you have to be able to know if there are restrictions to airspace. And there are ways to get waivers of restriction to the airspace. But as a practical matter, if we're talking about something rural like this, 
if you got a license, you can fly this and you can fly with impunity up to 400 feet above the property because that airspace is public. Interestingly enough, on the second day that Aubrey went out to fly this, some of the Daybell uh, uh, family came out and threatened to shoot down the drone. Now, thankfully, they didn't because that is a federal offense and uh, shooting down a drone, you may think, you know, that getting your shotgun out and makes you a, uh, uh, you know, a big uh, person protecting your property. Well, the truth is that you can go away. It's a felony. And uh, so we try to, when we fly uh, areas like this, we purposely plan our flights so that we take off and that the property owner doesn't even know we're there. Uh, you know, and we have enough range uh, and we use small enough drones now that we can pretty much do what we're doing without ever be, any, disturbing anyone. But uh, no, you, you have to have a license to fly commercially. If you're just doing it as a hobby, you can fly, uh, but uh, you can't go over 400 feet. And you, so, cannot, you can't fly in protected airspace. Now, what's interesting on this particular case, on the second day of the Daybell forensic work, law enforcement uh, saw KSL had a drone that it was up in the air, and they immediately called the FAA, and they got a temporary ban for any overflight over the Daybell property. And so all drones and uh, news aircraft, everything other than uh, law enforcement uh, were prohibited from flying. And, you know, that if you if you're a good operator, you'll know that because uh, you'll actually see alerts uh, on your equipment because uh, our equipment is tied in with the FAA so that we can see if we're violating airspace. Interesting. Well, Chris, I think so, you had a question, but let's, and then let's, uh, if you can, Mark, uh, make shorter answers and let's try to answer okay. a few more of these folks because there's some great questions coming in. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. So Joanne Australia asked, are there thermal drones that can be used at night? So it's kind of like a FLIR, I guess. Yes, there are FLIR yeah. drones. And then we've worked with uh, the largest drone manufacturer is DJI. They have some specific search and rescue craft that incorporate both thermal and visual cameras. And we have worked with those and they are excellent. Flying at night is a little bit tricky because obviously if you hit a, a, a guy wire or a high tension line, you know, you're going to lose a drone and a lot of expensive equipment. That's why you don't fly an area unless you know what's up there. But if you know during the day that the canopy is 60 feet high, I can fly at 70 feet and I will be over missing the trees. So, uh, yes, it can be done. It is done and uh, is uh, is is useful in some instances to fly at night. Awesome. Mike, you got one. So, here. so uh, what about the most interesting, memorable case? And don't give up the one I just talked about because you're coming back to talk about that. <laughs> well, we've had we've had some really interesting cases. One of my favorites was a, a diving accident that happened. Uh, off the coast of Hawaii at the Molokini Crater. And we were asked to uh, develop a 3D model with the University of Hawaii Oceanography Department. And so to do this, Molokini is a prohibited uh, sanctuary. So you can't get on the island. Uh, and so I flew to Hawaii, got up at six in the morning, rented a little boat, took a drone out, parked the boat, and I flew all of Molokini uh, and developed the uh, the 3D model. And then on top of that, we had to know what the subsurface lagoon was. And to get that, turns out nobody had ever mapped it, but I found an old 1863 book in the University of Hawaii laboratory where a steamboat captain had taken ropes and had done soundings and had mapped the lagoon. And the oceanogra oceanographer said, that's going to be close enough. There's not enough erosion or uh, water movement. So we will use that. So we built a whole model and determined wave simulations based on that. Oh. And if you are, if anybody's interested, go to the KSL television site and you'll find uh, a story that includes the visuals we did from that case. That's Fantastic. Awesome. Let's take one more. And then uh, I want to introduce you to somebody new. Uh, Mark, do you think this could help in the search for Suzanne at this point and this late stage? You know, the answer is yes. Uh, obviously, you're, you know, old is cold. But if you stop and think about it, you know, they're going out Friday and they got boots on the ground. And anything that you can do on the ground can be benefited and supplemented with 
with drone work or aerial work of any kind. So uh, I intend to talk to uh, this week and find out, you know, just do they have somebody that's got a drone that can uh, go out? But that will certainly help them coordinate and uh, and document the scene. It'll be really helpful if they come up with areas that may be of interest because you can actually fly, get the coverage. You don't even have to, you know, if it's really remote, you can get the drone there without having to go through the river and the water and everything to get to the place. That's amazing. Chris, I cut you off earlier. Did you have a question? No, no, I'm, I'm good, Mike. Uh, I just think Mark's been a fab, you know, just fabulous. Uh, what a great guy. I mean, your heart's in the right place, buddy. And we're, we're grateful that you've uh, taken some time with us tonight. I mean, well, you know, I, I will throw in that the next time that you have me on, uh, we still got a lot coming though. Don't anybody leave us. Tonight. I've got, I've got, a. <laughs> uh, I'm very benefited by having, uh, my wife is, uh, in the company and she happens to be not only a drone pilot, she's an actual civil aviation pilot and her father oh, ran safety good. for British airways. And so, she uh, is. Uh, uh, she had the experience that one of the first times when we went out together to fly, and I heard a shotgun go off, and I went up the hill and I saw her being held by a, a, a irate, a, a irate landowner who was trying to shoot her drone out of the sky, oh, and wow. I observed a woman who could <laughs> talk her way out of it, and by the <laughs> time the sheriff left. The uh, landowner was uh, begging her to send pictures of the property because she convinced him that it would be very useful for his real estate uh, interest. So she's know, a, she fantastic. she's a, has a lot of experience and she has that beautiful British accent. So we'll have her on the show. And we and, a lot of our audience is from the UK, so they'll really oh, appreciate fantastic, that. fantastic. Yes, yeah, absolutely. we have thousands of people from the UK, Mark. Um, yeah, let me yeah. let me bring in Jeremiah Lindemann, introduce you to him, Mark. I want you to meet him and. Uh, Mark, if you wouldn't mind, drop off your um, the screen. Just kill that screen for your um, oh yeah, Sorry that. so that he can bring in some. But uh, folks, we want you to meet another friend of ours, and this is a dear friend of mine, Jeremiah Lindemann, who is a GIS scientist, Mark, and so I'm sure he's uh, been interested in the things that he's watching and and uh, much of our drone to map uh, effort at uh, one of the companies that we're so close to. And uh, uh, Jeremiah is is uh, a driver of that. So I wanted you two to meet for a minute. And then I want you to uh, hope you'll stick around for a minute in the back room while Jeremiah talks about his brother and something that he's done that has changed the fabric of opioid addiction in, in our country and abroad. So Jeremiah, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Mike, for uh, inviting me. I, I want to just say a larger thank you for what you're doing. This is fantastic. I feel like I'm out of the, out of the loop, not knowing that you've been having this going. Uh, watching Mark's uh, presentation uh, and your dialogue with him, that, that was really uh, fascinating. And um, I live in Colorado. Uh, my heart definitely goes out to Andy, and I love the discussion on Suzanne. You know, she's been in the news here a little bit, and I, I'm well aware of the story, but not in the depth that it, the pieces you've been in the covering. I'm a little surprised that some of that hasn't been making out to the news wider here. Uh, so I will do my best to help propel that uh, locally here too. But yes, uh, thank you. I yeah, so I yeah, I, I work with uh, at at Esri. Uh, I uh, worked there for quite a long time, um, working within GIS. Uh, Mike brought me in to kind of talk about something where uh, I brought kind of a personal connection, a little bit of a side project that I just wanted to kind of help make some awareness about. So why don't you, why don't you go into it and te tell everybody about your brother and what motivated you? This is, this is a touching story, folks. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think it's a, you know, it's another probably tough subject, you know, sad subject, but something that needs to be brought to the forefront too. So my, my little brother, uh, JT Lindemann, was uh, a very charming personality, you know, the type of guy that would just, you know, light up the room with a smile. And you know, growing up, you know, he's always just always outgoing. He always seemed like he was just had amazing talents, great at musician, you know, drumming and guitar and really good athletically. You know, he's always a kid that was just, you know, hit home runs without thinking about it, you know, in, in Little League. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot I was, I was kind of jealous about, but, you know, we all loved him. He, he was just always so warm and comforting. And 
unfortunately he got involved in opiates and you know, he passed away uh, th through a, a process and it, it was it was a long process uh, you know like many people of you know addiction is, is hard and just kind of navigating that whole circumstance um, yeah. I was quiet about it for a long time I didn't speak about it and you know I, I think uh, you know, it got to a point where I felt like it was enough an, an issue hearing about other people in the US that were you know struggling with the same issue to see well how can I help make some awareness about this with, you know, the way that I could. So, um, Jeremiah, you, you uh, went to the leadership at Esri and got permission to take on a really big project that now has reached the National Safety Council and governments around the world. Why don't you pull up a map and show people what you've done and talk about how this has changed uh, the landscape and and folks, this is blessed families around the world who have had a place where they can share a story. Sure, yeah. So, uh, let's see, as I'm gonna get my screen going here, let's see. Um, so while Jeremiah is doing that, Mike, um, you know, this I, I think everybody knows this is a, this is a global uh, crisis. Um, you know, the the pharmaceutical industry back in the the mid 2000s, uh, you know, started releasing some pretty heavy duty opioids into the marketplace uh, to compete with, uh, you know, the pain medications as a whole, you know, oxycodone, um, methadone, which was a, which was a drug that was used during World War II for pain on the battlefield, um, was then, you know, rolled over in the early 70s, early 80s uh, to a, drug program for uh, to help with heroin addiction because it has a 24 hour what they call plasma life right up uh, uh, it stays in your system you know 12 to 24 hours so it was a lot easier and they call it a juice program so essentially you know guys would line up with a card you go to the juice program they you know give your methadone orange juice and you know you're on your way and you're good to go for you know a lot of people don't know you can't die from um, heroin withdrawals. You can die from alcohol withdrawals. It's called DTs, but not from heroin withdrawals. You can OD, okay? But if you just kind of, your your system, based on your tolerance levels, goes through, you know, a variety of different uh, problems. Well, in the early or late 90s, early, you know, 2000, uh, the pharmaceutical company started releasing uh, methadone back onto the street, in four to 10 milligram doses, uh, five to 10 milligram doses to compete with oxycodone. And as a result of that, uh, there was some, you know, some serious, you know, situations. And now the opioid problem, and I'm sure Jeremy's gonna get into it a little bit deeper here, but has now kicked into fentanyl and a variety of other synthetic drugs that are being manufactured in China, believe it or not. The majority of the fentanyl coming into the United States is coming from India and from China. Those are those are the two main uh, you know countries that are importing these drugs into the country. So, Jeremy, I didn't mean to get ahead of you there. Please forgive me. No, uh, it's but, great. Yep. Uh, yeah, definitely. There, there's a lot of history there that, to be uncovered. Yeah, and that, that was great. Great recap for sure. Yep. So go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's great. So there, there's a lot of maps and, you know, I, I make, you know, we, we usually map real data and that's probably how I got started. I was mapping, I got data from Colorado. I just wanted to kind of illustrate how things were changing on a county by county basis. And th that got popular. But one thing that kind of led to another is I, I got uh, involved with some groups here and I, I met another mom in Colorado and, you know, she said, we need a way to celebrate and, you know, showcase the, the people that we love. She lost her son too. And that was really the beginning of this map. And I'm really thankful that you know, now this is hosted by the National Safety Council. Um, you know, they, they do a lot of topics, you know, they, they got started about road safety, you know, decades ago and, and you're wearing seatbelts. Uh, but opiates is one of their issues uh, now as well, and especially within the workplace. Uh, but I'll just take a look at, at the, a larger map. They have it embedded inside there. But this is a heartbreaking map, um, almost 2,500 people. Every parent has basically come in here, clicked this add lost loved one button and fill out a story. So I can click on every person 
And I can see a story. Some families just add in a sentence or two uh, about that person. Usually what what's, what's makes that person great. You see a lot of similarities uh, from these stories. Um, there's a, Overdose Awareness Day is an actual thing. You know, this is such a crisis, um, you know, in, in our country and the world that uh, that was about two weeks ago. And every time that that grows around, the, the map grows quite a bit. Uh, so, yeah, again, about 2,500 people. Every state in the U.S. has at least one person on this map. So, you know, one of the reasons why this map was created is to really show that there are people everywhere. It is in your backyard uh, at, you know, at every place. Um, I think people pay attention more when they see um things are in their backyard, they pay attention to human stories. So Mike, I know, you know, you're in Utah and, you know, this is you know a sad story and not much was written here, but, you know, this is just, you know, this summer, uh, you know, someone passed away showcasing that the this this problem is, is ongoing. Um, my, my little brother um, you know, was in Laramie for a while and if we kind of zoom in, it's all um, sequ sequential. So if I kind of zoom out a little bit, He's the very first person on the map, and you know, I think the text you know really came from a lot of what probably my mom wrote in the obituary, you know, years ago. Uh, but again, again, really charming personality, and you know, we, we miss him, and we miss that great smile for sure. Um, but yeah, that, that's that's really kind of the idea of this map, and you know, I've I've done a lot of other mapping around this this topic, and and looking at you know trends and. Uh, just as you mentioned, Chris, about the, you know, how are, how is it changing from prescriptions to heroin to uh, fentanyl to car fentanyl and, and looking at those trends and things like that. But this is definitely is probably the most eye catching to know that what is happening uh, out there and just putting the, the human face on this. And there's still a lot of stigma about, you know, all oh, these are all people that are, you know, just, you know, shooting up in an alley. And that's, that's not always the case. There's a this is a hidden problem uh, for sure that, you know, you probably know people that are going through this that you might not be aware about. You know, uh, Jeremiah, you've, you've also put science behind this and you've looked at things like wastewater and, and how it coincides with um, opioid. And is there anything you could share on that, that this, this is not just, I mean, this map is a volunteer map for people to go in and, and list their family member and have them become part of this global story but there's also science behind how we can stop this effort too. What else is being done? Yeah, so, so that's one of the things I was, I was chatting with you a little bit about early today. Um, Tempe, Arizona is one of the places that's doing this. Um, they, if you basically look at this, they map by different areas within the city and they can basically map everything that you digest. So through the wastewater, they can see the levels of fentanyl, heroin, oxycodone, and codeine that are all in the system. You notice that they stop in February. They took a pause and they're actually testing for COVID right now. So they can uh, uh, see spikes there, but this is really kind of popular too. So you can see, you know, this green area, uh, if you're familiar with Tempe, Arizona oh, State. Oh, you're not showing your map though. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, if you can pull that up. Yeah, you could see me drive. Oh, what's okay. good. happening here? Okay. They're actually looking at the wastewater and determining what kind of um, chemical is being delivered back into the waste system. It could be even something indicative of COVID, like he's talking about. So go ahead, uh, uh, Jeremiah. Yeah, so um, you can kind of see if, if you're familiar with Tempe, Arizona State is kind of in this red area, so area two. But if you're looking at these trends, you see this green. It really kind of was going up in February. So, like, what does that mean? You know, there's there's probably something going on uh, for that that area. That you know, is there new you know dealers that are that are entering in that area, or like, what's causing that to supply? You know, I think that the thing that's interesting about this is you know bringing the science in. This is almost probably the closest thing you could get to an early detection um, system. You know, you. You see news articles and you say there's you know so many deaths in Cincinnati over the last 48 hours or, or things like that. But you start to look at something like this. This is an early detection of, hey, something's here. We Something's on the ground that we might not even be aware about before it gets bad. Yeah. That's um, fascinating. 
So, so Mark, I don't know if you or Chris have some questions for Jeremiah and uh, Jeremiah, if you could see if there's a link that would uh, go to any kind of foundation to support this or anything that we could pass to people if they're interested in, in uh, learning more or donating to it or whatever, it would be nice to get that link up. Oh, sure. Yeah. Thanks. I, I, I can pass along the national safety council uh, where the, the map is. And oh, they, we they, put they, that up. we've, we've okay, got great. It there, so cool. Yeah, great. You know, uh, Jeremiah, I was wondering, uh, that's such an amazing, you know, we're all about visualization and already I'm seeing things in my mind that this, this is a way to tell stories that, that we do. But I was also wondering, I'm assuming that there is a, available data for for all of these areas without being personalized to the stories, it might be interesting to see how does that map overlie a similar broad-based uh, opioid uh, history uh, or correlation. Have you, have you pulled any of that data? Cause I know it's, it's the CDC. As far as the, the death there. data and, and things like that. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like when I looked, looked at that map, I immediately recognized that looks real similar to the COVID maps that I've been following because it's a great way to see hotspots as you, and, you know, and you immediately see some of those major uh, uh, diameters of, uh, of tragedy. And I was curious, how much is that a function of um, happenstance of the people who are plugged in and, and entering the data as opposed to, you know, for instance, I'm sitting here in uh, the state of Kansas right now. And I know our neighboring states have huge problems as, as do we, but some more than our state. But when I look at your map, it looks like, you know, ah, we're not, we're not that bad. And I know that's not the case. I'm just curious, do you have any, you know, how much of a small sample error in terms of extrapolating? Uh, and I know you're not trying to show, you know, the, uh, the true, coverage of the uh, of the affliction but I'm just curious what's your sense of what you're seeing there in terms of geographically the population in the United States and where the uh, the biggest problems of opioid uh, addiction and tragedy are yeah so th that is a good good question I, I have done it kind of done some comparisons about who's contributed on the map and what's already there but I, honestly since it's a crowdsourced map I don't think we can really derive a whole lot from that the, the map is largely, how it really got going uh, is really two ways. There have been a couple of news reports on it. So you get a, a news report in the city of Milwaukee, and the next day you have a, you know, a couple dozen contributions. Right, right. Yeah. And, and then the other way is you have some local advocacy groups. You know, there's more moms that have lost someone, and, you know, they're trying to get the word out. And uh, they've done, you know, presentations with the map, and the, the, those areas kind of grow. So it's not indicative by any, any means, I think, like what's really happening in the U.S. It's more or less pockets of just, you know, activity, I, I think, is, is kind of what has happened. Well, one of the, you know, to dovetail into that thought, uh, Jeremy, I mean, uh, Huntington, West Virginia, I don't know if you remember, but uh, in 2016, they had 27 overdoses in four hours. Uh, and uh, one of the case agents up there is a good friend of mine. And uh, Mike, we may want to have him on. Uh, I'll, yeah, I, I'll, I'll really, get a hold of him. Yeah. So they, they, they hit... Uh, within four hours and it, it, it made national news, but uh, long story short, you know, their first responders uh, were hitting everybody with Narcan and come to find out it was just uh, you know, it was a bad uh, batch of, you know, tar heroin that everybody got stuck into. And it was just a horrible situation, but uh, you know, that, you know, just to qualify this, right. I mean, if somebody has an addiction, doesn't make them a bad person. Uh, at all. Uh, in fact, you know, they're trying to maintain, you know, their, their life equivalency. And, and, and a lot of that is, you know, based on, you know, personal pain and experiences. And, you know, I mean, Mike, you and I and others have worked with, you know, folks that are, you know, they have addiction problems. Um, but this situation today that, uh, you know, Jeremy's pointing out, I mean, this is epidemic in, por in proportions. I mean, we're, it's kind of been pushed to the background right now with COVID-19, but it's still going on pretty heavy uh, in this country. And, uh, you know, 
Um, it's, it's a very serious problem. I, I'm grateful for your courage, uh, Jeremy, to come up here and, and speak on behalf of your brother. Uh, you know, God bless you. Uh, they, yeah. you know, this, this is a huge deal, but go ahead. I, what, what no, I was just going to say, thank you. Th those are great words. And I, I love that you said, you know, they're, they're, they're great people that are good, just caught up in this oftentimes on, on hard times, you know, there, there was some hope in 2019 that the numbers seem to go down, but it seems like they're going up at a pretty big rate. And, you know, a lot of that it probably is because of COVID, you know, people are locked down and, you know, lost jobs and there's a lot of bad yeah. circumstances going on. So, the this crisis is actually going up a, a bit more this year. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, Jeremy, Jer Jeremy, now Chris has got me saying it. Jeremiah, uh, <laughs> I've watched you through this process for, well, I've known you now for 15 years. Um, how grateful I am for that association. I want to just pause for a minute. I want to keep you and Mark on for a minute, but I want to bring in Tim, our producer, uh, we've had people just pouring in with with kind donations tonight, and uh, if you all haven't had a chance to see Tim's YouTube channel and you like hiking and covering the back country, <laughs> you got to go to to his channel. And I'm just so grateful for what he does to help us out. Um, but Tim, why don't, you, why don't you read off some of those folks that have uh, donated tonight? That is so kind. Yeah, I've been keeping track as we've been going along because we didn't want to miss anyone. So, uh, Miss Sophie, thank you so much. $140 there. Truth Seeker, That's Judy, uh, sorry if I screw up your names. Mike and Chris are so much better at this than I am. But uh, Judy Eiler, Herod, $20. Retired Sergeant Melinda Loeffler, $25. Stay at home mom, Sorry. Detective, $100. Uh, Sunny Aaron, $50. T Royce, uh, seven dollars and uh, Mary Deethy Dills, ten dollars, Tracy Smith, ten dollars, Jane Bond, 007. That one's great. Uh, 1399, uh, Deb E, five dollars. And thanks, uh, Deb. Yeah, Sarge, Thank thanks, you. thanks again. Uh, why don't you send us a note of which agency you were with? And uh, thank you so much for your service. Uh, again, we we Keep in mind today, two police officers from Southern California who were shot last night in an ambush uh, attack. Yeah. And uh, this madness has to end. How grateful we are. Uh, Jeremiah, Mark, you um, have witnessed uh, probably close to a thousand chats going on in the window next to you tonight as we've been talking. Uh, in total, we'll probably have close to 10,000 people who have been in and out listening tonight, and this will go on for weeks and weeks as people watch this. Uh, we're going to just uh, see if there are some questions. Tim will put those up on the screen for you, and we'll have you answer them. And then if you guys have questions for Chris or me, throw them out. Heck, this is uh, – we call this choir practice. This is choir practice. Based on the old uh, Wamba shows. So um, – but uh, we can't thank you enough. So, um, Tim, do we have some questions? And then, Jeremiah, you or Mark, if you have questions for each other or for us, go ahead and throw them out and we'll answer them. Sweetie pie. Hi, Chappie. <laughs> yeah, hit us and don't shoot at us, whatever you do. You, know, you can do everything else, but don't shoot at us. You know, well, you guys, uh, you know, what do we got going here? So I want to go back and look at some of these questions, Mike. Let's see what we got here. Yeah, and uh, Jeremiah, I mean, what would be the message you would have for a surviving family member of something like this? I mean, I, I, there's just no way we can talk about how to recover from the heartache of losing your loved one. But what's the hope that comes from something like this effort you're doing? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question, too. You know, you know, when it comes to grief, everyone grieves differently, and there's no prescribed recipe that can be given for that. But I think at the, you know, what I was guilty of, and I think a lot of people do is you can bury it, especially around the, the stigma and the shame. And you shouldn't be, I mean, there, there's a, you know, unfortunate, there's a very unfortunate, sad community that you know, people are like us that, that are in this. And I think it's a bit healing to, you know, talk about it. And, you know, to, to anything that is, you know, bad in this you know, world, you know, talking about it is, and, you know, bringing it to the forefront is what's going to help get it better. Yeah. No, I agree with that 100%. And Jeremy, I mean, Mike knows and a lot of our viewers know, you know, I lost a son in 2003. 
Uh, and so it's been 17 years for me. Uh, but I take solace in a, a very neat little poem. Uh, and I'm going to hack it up, but it kind of goes like this. It says, uh, here we sit upon the shore and we see the ship into the distance as, he, as she enters into the horizon. And we say to ourselves, there she goes. But we fail to remember on the other side of that horizon in another beach is somebody else staring and saying, here she comes. And so I always take, you know, when I'm having a bad day and last Friday was, uh, you know, the third of uh, September was uh, my son's anniversary, 17 years. Um, I take solace knowing that, um, you know, um, I was a good dad. I was a good, you know, and everything else, you know, the universe is on schedule. So if you get stuck, my friend, you're, if you get stuck, and I'm going to hack your name up all night long, so don't worry about it. Oh, good. You know, yeah. you know it, it gets good. But uh, if you ever get stuck and you want to throw rocks at 3 o'clock in the morning, you've got my number from this point forward. You just you just call me up, and we'll throw rocks at 3 o'clock in the morning. And for anybody else, our, our, our PE family out there, we love you guys. You know, we know a lot of you uh, have been through a lot of different challenges. And Mike and I you know, are just honored and, and privileged to be uh, part of your, uh, you know, your existence as well. And, uh, but don't give up, whatever you do, do not give up. There is always somebody out there that's going to help you. So that's what's helped me, you know, to get through some of those dark times too. Amen. Just a small piece. Thank you. Yeah, it's beautiful. Okay. Thanks, Chris. I think I can answer this question for uh, Mark. Uh, the drone probably is not going to pick up that big slab of concrete in Suzanne's case, that would be one massive drone. But uh, I think, Mark, maybe we'll just twist this just a little bit and talk about sensory and being able to sense through other things. I, I think she's asking about could a drone pick up the fact that a body was encased in concrete. And, uh, you know, that's an interesting question. It would, uh, it would probably, if it's buried and if they're in this heat signature, the answer would be no. But uh, if it is at all exposed in any way and if there's any erosion patterns or if you had somebody that went to that length to actually encase a body in concrete you're probably going to see some uh, visual disturbances at least that would make it a candidate to be uh, followed up on so i appreciate that question well to mark johnson and jeremiah lindeman thank you so much i'm going to give chris a minute to drop any final thoughts he has and then uh, invite you all to carry on the conversation uh, later in, uh, help me again, Chris. Uh, Discord. Discord. <laughs> yeah, Chris. Uh, you know, Mike, it's been a fascinating evening. We've been, uh, we've learned a lot uh, tonight. We learned a lot from Andy uh, about, uh, you know, his upcoming search you know, for his little sister. It's still going 150% and everybody's support uh, there. Uh, Mark came in and just blew my socks off. I mean, good grief. The guy's measuring grass blades at the, <laughs> at the, uh, you know, the table property. It, it doesn't get any cooler than that. Uh, and then of course, you know, Jeremiah and his amazing tribute to his brother and starting the, uh, uh, the programs that he's got going. Guys, everybody uh, that was here tonight is better. For being here and uh, for that I'm grateful and of course you Michael love you like my brother and uh, we're just grateful that everybody's subscribing and pressing the button and sharing with your friends and um, so good night I can't yeah. wait until the next one well and I want you to just talk about what's happening Thursday night Chris because that's going to blow some minds and folks please subscribe and we're, we're almost at uh, 24,000 help us get past 24 by the time we meet Thursday night, the growth we've had because of you is just so amazing. But wait till you hear what's coming Thursday. Is that uh, the doctor? Yeah, yeah. It, oh, you mean Dr. Ho? Judy Dr. Ho? Dr. Ho's coming. Dr. Judy Ho, a triple board certified and licensed clinical forensic neural uh, psychologist. Uh, you've probably seen her all over TV, but she's coming here. Uh, to share some time with uh, us and our family here. So uh, it's going to be a big one. So she's, she's Dr. Judy Ho. Dr. Phil, right? Yeah, she's all over Dr. Phil. She's been CBS, podcast, 
uh, the doctor. She's co-host of CBS Face the Truth. Uh, she's the real deal. And uh, she's coming to chat with us. And we're going to be talking about the psychology of a police investigation. And she's going to be kind of picking apart Chris and she's me. She's going to grill us. <laughs> and, uh, this is going to be really interesting because we're going to delve into some of the emotion that police officers feel as they go through these kinds of cases. And Mark, I think maybe what we'll have to do is come back with the psyche of a defense attorney, <laughs> prosecutor, and uh, we'll really explore that. But uh, to, to everyone that's helped out, Chris and I are so thankful to the Profiling Evil family. You've made this a lot of fun for two old gumshoes that don't know what to do with their time. So thank you so much and may God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.